hurt yourself. What's his name? I met him. I met his daughter. He's the one that's trying to make a big shot. Oh. All right, they're all almost here. It's a family. We're going to take you back in time and give you an incredible history and story of what happened here in this big house. Ago! Ame! Ago! Ame! Ago! Ame! All right, so, brothers and sisters, we are now at the Palava Hall. This hall was the market, the slave market. So here, they brought the captives. The Europeans bought them. From here, they were taken downstairs. Downstairs, they were branded. And after they were branded, they were kept in the dungeons to wait on the ship. So, slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, in this building started here. So this was the first point of contact before the dungeon. The men came, the, the individuals from part of the British? No, so it's like here. You have representatives of the British companies here. So here, they bought the captives. So before they would buy a captive, first of all, they would check some matters in this or that person's body. Cleared up now. Okay, so before they got on the boat. Yes. So first of all, this was the first point of contact. Oh, they come out the dungeon, they come up here. Oh, not in the dungeon. No, no, no. Immediately you were brought from the interior, you didn't go straight to the dungeon. Oh, they, oh, okay, I understand. You hear? First, they yeah. come here, understood. They 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 the, the yes, then they would take them to the courtyard, brand them, okay. and they keep them in the dungeon. Okay, so when the ships come, they take them away. Okay. Also, when we talk about British rule, when we talk about colonization in this country, it started right here. And how Ghana was colonized was, was something. It wasn't like the British fought us and we had to like fight back and were defeated. And ours was more like the British disunited us. So after disuniting us, we became weak and they now controlled. This is what the Europeans did all over Africa. So here, I'll talk about two tribes. So, but in Ghana, we don't have only two tribes. We have about 49 tribes in Ghana. Meaning we have about 49 languages in this country. We have the Chin, the Ashanti, Dakumba, Fanti, Ewe, Nzema, Wasa, and all that. We have a lot. But I'll talk about the Fantis and the Ashanti. So the Fantis are coastal people. And the Ashantis are the interior. So when we talk about Fantis, you are still within the Fanti area or Fanti zone. Again, when you move about 100, 100, 150 kilometers east, if you move another 150 kilometers, let's say west, you are still within the Fanti zone. Way back, the Fantis controlled the coast. So if you are from the interior and you want to trade your things to the Europeans, there was no way you could have a direct trade. So that was what the Fantis enjoyed. We also have the Ashantis. Around the 17th, 18th century, the Ashantis actually controlled about 50% of present-day Ghana. These guys were warriors. At some point in time, the Ashantis wanted a direct trade with the Europeans without any interference from the Fantis. The Fantis didn't give them Ashantis because a conflict came up. There was war among the Fantis and the Ashantis. But let's put that one aside. Let me draw attention to this. Before that, you know, it was England's aim, aim to control this territory. For England to control Ghana, then England would have to subdue the Ashantis. Because, again, the Ashantis were sitting on the largest gold deposit in Africa. So if the Ashanti is subdued, now the British will have two things. They have this territory and they, are, they, are control, they control the gold also. They tried alone defeating the Ashantis, but they did not succeed. The Ashantis beat the British in battle. There were several battles that were fought between England and Ashanti. The Ashantis won those battles. So England realized that there was no way they could defeat the Ashantis alone. Now, England also realized that Fanti and Ashanti had conflict. So England supported the Fantis against the Ashanti. So it's not like the English liked the Fantis, no they looked at their interest first. The British realized that if Ashanti should control the coast, then it is bad business for England. Because now, 
the English cannot manipulate the Ashantis for their pricing. If Fanti controls, they could manipulate the pricing. So it's a win-win thing for them, right? So England did everything in its power to protect the Fantis. But the English had a focus. So the focus was to get to the Ashantis. So the focus was to unite the enemies of the Ashantis against them. So this was the first step England did. So now England told, so like for example, you are the Fanti person I'm protecting. And I tell you, my friend, I cannot protect you for free anymore. Give me something, then I can protect you. So I now tell you, accept me as your ruler and protector for 100 years. And I'll continue to protect you. Then I bring that offer, you say yes. So now they brought all the leaders of the Fanti state here. There were eight of them. They brought them here and they signed that you will be under British protection and the British control for 100 years. Good. So one enemy of the Ashanti was united with England. So now the other coastal people were brought here. And as a result, the Ashantis expanding their empire, you know, they made a lot of enemies with some other powerful tribes like the Akwamu, the Achim, the Dentra, the Ga, and the Fantis. So what the British did was the British united all these people on their side and used them against the Ashantis around 1874. So 1874, the battle was just like Britain and Ghana against Ashanti. So the Ashantis had no chance. 1874, the Ashantis were defeated during the Sagranti War. And after their defeat, it made it easy for the British to control this territory. Now the Ashantis were forced to be part of the British Empire. And some of the areas the Ashantis controlled, the British controlled. So that is how Ghana was ruled by Great Britain. Wow, that's a tragedy. Like one of the terrible Shakespeare stories. Yeah, our own people united with the oppressors to take over the stronghold. So basically, the Ashanti was a stronghold yeah. of you know, what is modern day Ghana. Yeah. Yeah, so as I said, all the time, they try as much as possible to make us disunited. Because the more disunited we are, the vulnerable and we that are. That is a great example of how it works in their favor right there. Exactly. Exactly. A great presentation, brother. Exactly. And, you know, that has been the case everywhere the Europeans have invaded in the 20th century. Yes. Like in Iraq, the Sunnis and the Shia, yes. they will use the one that does not favor to get to the other the same one. Same divide and rule exactly. uh, technique. So that's, we have the same divide and conquer strategy. Existence. So when Ghana became part of the British Empire, officially this building was now the seat of government. So the British governor, the representative of the British crown, left here. Yes. So now the trading, the slave trading activity was over. So officially, this building was used for political reasons because politics brought money. So now you are ruling, right? You don't buy the gold, right? You don't pay the human resources. Exactly. Aha, uh -huh. so now, <laughs> come on, I'm controlling you. You don't have any say. I take your gold, I take your bauxite, I take your lithium, I take, I take all your women. women. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that is what actually happened to us. And Cape Coast also served as the first capital city of this country. But on 19th March 1877, the British removed the capital from Cape Coast to Accra. So I'll tell you why the British did that, you know. We can say that Western civilization in this country started at the coast, mainly Cape Coast, Alamina, and Accra. So the people here were given that Western form of education or that Western form of ideas. And later, the locals here used the same Western ideas the Europeans gave them against the Europeans. I'm saying this for a fact. Um, the British passed a law in our history books, we called it the poll tax ordinance. It was a tax that England brought up. Okay, hey, this is the tax. Every citizen is supposed to pay this. So the more taxes you pay, the richer England becomes. Because now all the money is sent back to England. 
But unfortunately for the English, the people here said, no, we're not going to pay this tax. There was boycott, the people resisted, there were agitations, there was violence and all that. The British feared that a revolution might have escalated here. You know, they went back to the drawing board and they realized that this led to something some centuries back in America when they passed a law, a tax law, and that tax law led to a revolution. Then the Boston Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party, yeah. So now the English were kicked out of America as a result of that. The guys, the Americans were fed up. We're not going to pay the tax again. They formed, you know, the Sons of Liberty was formed and they rebelled against England. England was kicked out. So the English feared that similar might escalate here. So quickly, they moved the capital from Cape Coast to Accra to calm things here in Cape Coast. Because if they should leave early, then they will not enjoy the gold, the ivory, and those things here. So they took the capital out to Accra to avoid a revolution from escalating here in Cape Coast. And not only that, also Cape Coast, the people of Cape Coast have actually done very well for this country and for some of the areas the English ruled. So yes, the British passed another law. This was a, a, what do you call it, a land law. Now England passed a law that, okay, I'm ruling over you. You don't own your land. The land is for England. And I learned similar laws were passed in Kenya and some other areas. Again, some men in Cape Coast said, no, this will not stay with us. They called them the Aborigines Right Protection. They formed a delegation sponsored their own trip from Cape Coast to England. They petitioned Queen Victoria. So the British Crown now changed their minds. They gave back our lands to us as a result of the effort those men made. So had it been them, Ghana would have been like some southern part of Africa where like we live in Ghana where we don't own our land. Our oppressor owns the land. But as a result of the effort the people made, now that law had to be stopped or changed. The guy's the only one that has done that? Yeah, so historically, the Ghanaians did that in the 19th century. Yeah. So had it been that step they made, perhaps, we'll still be like, okay, if we need a land, we have to go to England. We have to, yes. <laughs> Unbelievable. The treaty that was signed in this room, yes. where is this treaty where is it? Is it a museum? I think it's, I think I think it's, in, it's in Accra. It's in the National Archives in Accra. Are people allowed to see the treaty? I think so. I think so. We have it in the National Archives in Accra. I think so. Okay. So maybe when you're in Accra, you find the National Archives, you can see that treaty, the bond of 1844. So, so let me, let me, something interesting happened. So um, on paper, Ghana was supposed to be ruled by England for 100 years starting on 6th March 1844, ending on 6th March 1944, because 1944 marks the 100 years. But the English did not grant independence. We had to force them. So our first president, Dr. Kwame Krumah, argued with the bond of 1844 and said, look, my friend, this is what my people signed. It is time now, give us independence. But they did not give independence till 1957. So our first president intentionally chose the same day the bond was signed to mark the end of British rule. So the bond was signed on 6th March 1844. We had our independence on 6th March 1957 to say the bond is broken. We are an independent state. May I know what ethnic group uh, Dr. Kwame... Uh, okay, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was an enzyma. In Zima. So in Zima, they are found in the western region of Ghana. It's a coastal village. So in Zima will be about uh, roughly about between 150 to 200 kilometers from here. So he was actually called Francis. Francis Nkrumah. But you know, he changed his name. He removed the, the western name and chose Kwame Nkrumah, the day born. And, uh, so let me also educate you on something here, and then we'll continue. We didn't have surnames here. We didn't have surnames. We didn't have Christian names. So if I'm a father and I have a son or a daughter, I can name my child 
first of all, we give the day born names. If you are Tuesday and you are a male, it's Kapana. If you are a female, you are Apana. Then I can name my child after my mother, my father, my uncle, or a friend. Or I can name a child after an event. We didn't have any surnames like that. Now the Europeans came and were like, it's by force to have a first name and a last name. Because now we were converted to Christianity. So now before you were baptized, you should get the first name, and a, the Christian name and the surname. So again, one way our tradition was also changed. And there's another interesting thing here. In Ghana, we had our own way of getting married. We had our traditions. And now people feel that if you do the traditional marriage, they don't consider, they don't consider that as valid unless you do it the European way, that they consider that as valid. So these are some of the things colonization affected us on a lot of things. Thank you for the very yeah, You're welcome. Yes, the father and the surnames, because in the US, the brown surnames derived from the slave owner. Oh, nice. yeah. mm -hmm. Is that similar in Ghana? So in Ghana also, we had those European surnames as a result of Europeans intermarried with some of the local ah, people. Okay. So even European here married an African woman. Mm -hmm. When they give back, they give the child their surname. And also, it's just like, you see that if, um, what the, the superiority thing. Uh, you, you see, now, you feel that if you don't have a European name, you, you look inferior. Now think about it, like, if you have a local name, oh, it's not good. Nah, 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 let me have a foreign name. Let me have a, a Western name. So that is what Western education also did to us. So now some of the locals actually abandoned their local names and preferred using European names. Yes. So they, some felt much better maybe having an, an European name compared to having an African name. So the mindset was actually twisted. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Right, so let's have a look at the governor's prison.